Hello, welcome to another Sonic Lab presentation. We're here with uh, George from Hello. UDO, who's just down the road in Bristol. Uh, last time we saw you, George, it was uh, uh, at Sheffield, and you showed us kind of the, the development of the Super 6, which is pretty much on course for, well, it's being constructed now, right? Yeah, yeah, we've, we've started production. They're, they're starting to sort of come off the production line now. I think you saw the same one in Sheffield, the same yeah, physical this implementation. Okay, yeah. So yeah, we've been obviously gradually enabling the features. It's now in uh, with beta testers. So there's instruments around the place and we have a sort of channel and we're basically making the last refinements really. And I'm really excited to uh, put it in. Well, I remember hands. your demo, everybody was kind of like, ooh, that's nice. And I know because you've been, while well, you've been setting up here, it's very much, you kind of, you're always off on a sonic journey. I mean, you made this to be a very hands-on, very kind of, you know, something that didn't require you to dig around to get sounds, no barriers to, to creativity. Absolutely, 100%. I, I couldn't have said it better myself, basically, that this was built as an instrument that I wanted to play. And I think to play and to have fun with it is sort of the key part, such that kind of patch development, playing and programming are not two exercises. It's an instrument. OK, yeah, it has a keyboard. This is an important part of the instrument but everything's playable. You know, every control is sort of easy and clunky and large with nice movements and it's sort of, sort of right there for you. So the idea is that, you know, you can kind of have an instrument which lets you go on a sort of sonic journey quickly. And you've, you've very carefully sort of chosen these components. I mean, you're very, you're very finickety about the kind of stuff that you use, right, in your synthesizer designs. Yeah, we have tried really hard. Like this one is like, we've really gone to kind of great details with it to try and kind of, you know, get every last little detail of the sound right. You know, we've got sort of nice filters from um, SSI in America here. This is the sort of analog section. Obviously the analog section needs a lot of prototyping and a lot of kind of work to get the tone right. We've got the FPGA digital oscillators and we've sort of tweaked and worked with those sort of for a long time. We've got different types of oscillator technology. Oscillator one is a kind of wavetable beast with nice kind of like the sort of super wave stereo technology. Oscillator two is, is an algorithmic oscillator which is more akin to sort of virtual analog. And when you combine the two together, you sort of got, um, you've got a bit of flexibility there and, and kind of, yeah, yeah, we spent a lot of time just getting the basic elements as, as they should be. And this is, um, just to recap, 12 voice. Yes, that's correct, yeah. Uh, with the binaural uh, button, yes. which looks a bit like a sort of Everlast belt there, sort of that adds meat and potatoes. Yeah. So you've got kind of, I've probably asked you this before, but what exactly is the binaural aspect of it? Because I think perhaps sure. people aren't aware with that terminology in synthesizer. Sure, so basically the key thing is, a kind of, um, most synthesizers have inherently a mono oscillator. I think if we were to really sort of strip it right down, the yeah. oscillator sound source tends to be one, yeah. one source effectively. And then sometimes there's some panning and some chorusing that's put on at the end of a, right. an otherwise mono signal chain. In this synthesizer, we have effectively stereo oscillators who have um, their various partials um, slightly phase controlled by a system, um, which effectively lets us widen up and kind of... So it's almost like stereo beating. In that kind of that slight detune and slightly, I can hear it's just gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, I've got my headphones on here. So when I was like um, doing some sort of sound exploration earlier, I had um, I could sort of actually hear it because these are obviously really wide the speakers in this room. But it's quite nice. It's not just for um, wide stereo effect. It, it it can be very very subtle. But the key thing is it's it's to try and make the sound. Um, sort of fit more in, in a kind of acoustic space. Right. Because okay. often electronic instruments are very sort of placed. And they're right there and kind of you put headphones on, you sort of play a sawtooth wave and it sort of feels like it's right in the middle of your head. And sort of trying to basically make something that plays with the idea of, okay, let's say you had a point source of sound mm -hmm. in the distance. You hear it, you hear it with your two ears. How it reaches your ears at different times gives you a sense of position right, okay. and also the sort of transfer function you get slightly different sort of 
frequency response on each side depending on its position. So the stereo filters then, so when you take the stereo oscillator base, which is at the beginning, and then pass it through the stereo analog chain, the sort of subtle variations there sort of help to give the sound a sense of stereo interest and right. positioning, okay. basically. So, I mean, this is really just the sound I was messing around on um, while we were here, but you can hear straight away that it's... got a kind of very sort of spready, sort of mm. smooth sound. It's difficult to just describe. It is, yeah, actually. I know. But, but, <laughs> but I mean, essentially, it's like a true stereo path, but with a stereo oscillator source going through that stereo path that, That's that makes the most of that. Oh. And, and sort of, we try to make use of that um, signal path as much as we can. You see here, we've actually got a LFO with a phase control. So the, the oscillators themselves, particularly DDS1, has got a sort of embedded um, sort of phase control. So you can, you've got like a stereo LFO effectively, or your LFO, yeah, right. Effectively, um, but the filters, you've got more precise control here. So you can move controls. I don't know if the audience can hear that. So we've got like a, a, a ramp, a ramp wave on that. Yeah, so you're getting a, a, a separation effectively with the, in the filter yeah. as well. So we've actually got one waveform going to one speaker, another waveform going to another, and we can decouple them and control them. So a good example is if I say take, um, let's change the waveform to something more straightforward, shall we, like just a sawtooth. So you've got effectively tremolo. It's actually an interesting way of demonstrating it. The movement between tremolo consistently varies through to pan and back to tremolo. Right, okay. And then through through pan back to tremolo again. Interesting. It definitely has a, I mean, particularly with the sort of slow movement, I mean, the pads you've been playing have just, they've, they've got this a stereo life to them. Because you've got chorus and delay on these, but you're not really dialing much of that. There's actually a bit of delay on. I'll turn that off like... completely. But there's no chorus at the moment, so. So this is a completely dry sound. It just has that sort of, I don't know how to describe it. It's, yeah. it's like. <laughs> You've got this sort of nice richness and a bit of stereo movement, and it just oh. So when you're in binaural, when you're in binaural mode, does that half the oscill half the voice count? So we're we going from it twelve does. in regular to, to to six stereo voices. Yeah. Right, so okay. if you turn the binaural mode off, you effectively go to a twelve voice, so you have twelve mono voices. Right. Now, interestingly, it actually doubles the number of oscillators because rather than having one oscillator, which is effectively with its phase controlled partials. Try not to be too techy about that. You end up with two free running oscillators, obviously one for each voice. There are a couple of limitations, but not very many. You basically have one LFO per voice of this main LFO in, in binaural mode. Um, but in um, when you decouple it to polyphonic mode, you only have six LFOs instead of the full 12 right. um, for, for that. But other than that particular limitation, and of course it's monophonic, you still have the nice chorus. At the end, yeah. So um, you, to, you still to get to it. those places. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that has always been a joy to watch you do is kind of is to to work through the process of making sounds. I mean, I think last time we spoke, the wavetable implementation because this has got actual user wavetable and, oh, and yeah. wavetables in as well. We hadn't seen any of that. So is that now working? Yeah. So it's really fun actually. If you flip it to that position, have we got a bit of crazy stereo going? Select our sort of interesting waveform bank here, and um, it's quite nice because although you know the, the classic, waves yeah, there. the classic analog waves, they're lovely, but this kind of goes a bit beyond analog and lets you do some kind of more interesting timbres. Well, say more interesting, just different. 
And if I bring that sound very quickly down into a nice kind of more percussive sound. So are the wave shapes fixed or can you scan, can you modulate between you know, the slices or is it just a kind of more of a, a, an accessing individual oh. waves? These, at the moment, as you've got the implementation here today, are waveforms, right. more specifically. And what's quite interesting is that because we use um, uh, extremely high sample rates, we only have to do very, very, very minimal band limiting. Right. So they behave almost like... Oh, it's quite a nice belly sound, as you try something different. They behave like... analog basic waves, effectively. Like CP80. It's weird, isn't it? You, I've, as soon as we put the, um, the digital waves on, it starts sounding like kind of something else. early. Yeah, something else completely. Before, it's like you've got your really nice a flip back to really basic. Um, oh, we're really only listening to one oscillator here, by the way. Oh yeah, everything's one oscillator at the moment. Wow. Okay. Back to wave tables. Start sounding a bit like a kind of early digital synthesizer from well, the 90s. Well, yeah, without the noise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, and, and the kind of really nice high end, of course, that you get afforded from the um, uh, yeah from the very high sample rates and the FPGA processing. Effectively, oscillator one, oscillator two different architectures built in different ways. You have to think that the internals of the synthesizer are built like virtual pieces of hardware. Right. Whereas opposed to sort of CPU and DSP is like um, instructions that are executed. When you design something with an FPGA, you, it's like you're designing a piece of hardware effectively. Right. And then it has its own quirks and it has its own character and it has its own sound. And I think that um, when you play around with this instrument, you start to get the, the sort of feeling for that. And it's got a really nice kind of like I've gone out of the audio range there, but yeah, that, there's that's high and there's no aliasing going on or you, anything there. It's really clean. And I think that's that's one of the interesting things. You can do go right down to the bottom end with this synth. Thing. That's an interesting sound already, isn't it? That's like almost. Uh, Well, hopefully you can get the feeling that we've got there from what we had a minute ago, and, and it's just, yeah, everything's just, just live on the panel. We see the LEDs on. We've not used any patches. We've just literally just moved a couple of things, and we've gone into a, a sort of different area, basically. So, and of course, back to your kind of. Interesting. Oh, that's the second oscillator for the first time. Uh, filter, what's the filter? This is a uh, bore pole. A uh, resonant filter right. from a company in the USA, um, SSI, who um, effectively make SSM type chips. So it's a classic polysynth filter. I believe this particular filter is, I think there's a monopoly over there. Similar sort of filter? Yeah, I think it's the same filter as that and the Poly 6. Um, don't quite, I might not. But have it's that stereo, one. obviously. Yeah, so, so you've got so. two of them, two of them here. Um, and you've also got a nice, um, let's put a bright waveform. feature that lets you take out the bottom end. So that's sort of a nod to the Roland school of uh, polysynths. Absolutely. And it's actually really useful, not for this type of sound actually, but if you want to make a more... Um, uh, more percussive kind. Yeah. yeah that would be too much, 
It's actually quite nice for your keyboardy type noises. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I know where we've got to here. It's quite Christmassy in a way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Christmas in anyway, Organy. Moving on, but that's what is that's what is that that's so, very and that's resonant as well. And you can put, you can play the resonance and you can actually tune that up and create almost a third sound source from that. As you well. can with the low pass filter, absolutely you can make it um, it's got various processing on. Okay. But yes, you can with the uh, with the low pass filter. You can make it self oscillate nice and actually. play it's, the. Um... It's quite a clean resonance, isn't it? Yeah. You've got some modulation there in the filter, I think. Oh yeah, that's why. So uh, that's quite nice. Um, you can change that character. And that's with a bit of drive, is it? Yeah. Effectively, this drive control basically just does so. Polysynth. Pull up the resonance and it thins out usually. The drive control in the middle position means that when you bring in the resonance. It's a bit of bass compensation the, almost, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But what Good. it does is it bass compensates by driving the input of the filter, which actually changes the character a little bit, makes the filter a bit rougher. And you know, you said the resonance was clean a minute ago. When you're up here, it, it's just, very smooth. You oh, get a kind a of. Um, yeah, oh, you get a, nice. it. It does. It does change the character somewhat. It has got a nice quality. I mean, it, it it's almost Rolandy, but it's not. It's it's actually got a different quality to it. There, there's a cleanness which I like about it. Mm, I, think I think it's fair to say, you know, we're Roland fans. Right, that, okay. Like, you know, looking at this, there's going to be a lot and of And it's got the number six on it. So, and yeah. it's got a number six on it. However, the the sort of visual layout and the kind of, um, you know, that side of, that's as far as it goes. Yeah. Inside, the actual element that makes the sound, everything about it is, is kind of... But the UI is a kind of inspiration. The UI, uh, very well, much so. You were also showing us a little bit about the, the what we can use the LFO for, because this goes right up into audio rates, and oh, you've, got, yeah. you've got pitch tracking on that as well, which I think is a really nice... The LFO is really fun. I've been playing around a lot with that. I really, really like it. Um, I'll see if I can sort of do something with it. So it's interesting, we've got quite an interesting patch there. Oh, there's aftertouch here as well. Going oh, on. yeah. Just regular aftertouch, poly aftertouch, what's the... It is mono aftertouch on this keybed, but the whole synth does respond to poly aftertouch. Oh, nice. So it okay. responds to poly aftertouch, it responds to poly expression, obviously press and release velocity and polyphonic bend as well. So that when you actually enable um, the MPE mode here, you can actually use an MPE cable controller to get your, your five. Different manufacturers use different terminology, but your five dimensions yeah, in, in the Rolly right. universe. Right, okay. Um, um, but yeah. So you're introducing some modulation there. Hey, we were talking about the LFO there. The, and the pitch tracking on the LFO. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. We'll have a little look at that. Um, so what I'm going to quickly do here is I'm going to flip back to the init patch. So to go back to init patch, pull everything into the down position. Oh, you're not recalling, you're just going to go right. I'm not recalling, no, I'm just going to put a simple sawtooth on, everything in the down position. Here we go, you just set that one up, and that one up, and that one up, and hopefully... Okay, it's got a heavy chorus on it, forgot one thing, but... Okay. So hopefully that's kind of, um, yeah demonstrated how quickly that is. Okay, right, I'm in the starting point now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can do a bit of sound development. So let's put a bit of phase control on there. Okay, and the LFO section, let's say we map that to bring down the cutoff slightly. Give ourselves a bit of filter modulation. And we get, we've got LFO per voice, of course, so let's give ourselves a bit of um, run on with the... Um... Right, the envelopes. So we're really getting the... Yeah, bring in a bit of phase, left, right, for a bit of stereo interest, so if we... So anyway, 
So we've yeah. got to a nice patch yeah, straight okay. away. I moved a couple of sliders, but let's show you where the LFO goes. So if I flip it up here. So that's pretty high up. But the key, the key, key tracking is now also being applied, right? So now I've actually just got it fixed, so I'm just varying it. Yeah? So you've got nice kind of FME. Very quite harmonic, actually. Mm. It's quite difficult to get harmonic sort of deep FM sounds. With cross modulation. Um, but now we make it track. So you can hear the sort of effect of the phasing control as well. Now that should, in an ideal world... So that's now tracking that additional pitch? Yeah, absolutely. And we can make it sort of fade in over some time. Got a sort of um, let's give that a bit of chorus. Start touching there. So that's the LFO applying its pitch, it, it, its pitch yeah. mod, FM mod to. Is that just the the, the VCF there? So it's I a, mapped it to the VCA there. So if I take the FM off, oh, I've got a bit of pitch on. I've got a pitch amplitude and everything. Chorus is kind of swamping it a bit. So we'll take that off. That's going right up there, isn't it? Oh, and actually, I've actually can do this. Now you're listening to the LFO, it actually maps through the audio path. So if I... So you can bring that in as a, effectively a third oscillator source. Yeah, so if I put the delay control up and now kind of let's uh, let's go to a complex waveform. And let's uh, give it a bit of uh, attack and release. change the waveform of the LFO so that we can make that sound like more like a square wave or so what what way what waveform are we listening to there? A sine wave. Ah, okay. In the high frequency modes it is locked to a sine wave. Right, okay. However, the more I look at that the more I think about it would be nice to have a little cheat code in there, wouldn't it? So we'll uh, we'll say that because it would be nice I was thinking to actually have um, have any of your wavetables appear in that position. So Ooh, there's, okay. there is inherently no reason why that shouldn't be the case. So maybe we. I'm uh, guessing the firmware guy is. The firmware guy is in just there going, no, so he's, no, he's, he's just had stop. a thing added to his little <laughs> pile. But well, I guess the thing. I mean, so where we are with this is ultimately, you know, the hardware, the yep. architecture is all sorted. It's just a question of kind of working through the last bits on the firmware and getting the yep. final patches. People have together. been gigging with this. I've been gigging with it. I did a demo in Berlin with it last uh, week at Schneidersladen workshop. It's going to be up soon. They've chucked this thing around. Um, I've seen it bounce being loaded onto the plane and just all sorts of dreadful treatment. So it's, it's really good. The hardware's been really put through its paces now. We've had this for quite a long time. And we've built the first kind of mini low rate initial production. They're out there. And so, yeah, we're getting these features just right. But hopefully you can hear mm. from the sounds today that you know, it's it's really opened up now compared to even where it was kind of at Sheffield. I mean, it's it's fair to say at 
super booth, we were winging it. Right. Um, <laughs> but we really... But people responded really well to it, didn't they? I mean, there are people going, wow. And you, you've kind of got... Uh, it's not a pre-orders thing, is it? This it's it, it's you know people are waiting until they get. I mean, I know some dealers are maybe are saying it'll be coming mm. soon, but you know you're you're very much of the kind of like when it's ready, then we'll release it and you can buy it, right? Yeah. Rest assured um, to anyone that's waiting on the synth. Um, firstly, thanks for their support, but secondly, we are we are really full tilt on it now. Right. But like you say, we really want to make sure that what people receive is bang on. I mean, your background is in working in sort of other kinds of hardware, you know, non-instrument based where quality is really key and you've brought that ethic into this as well. Yeah, I, I've had a, a sort of career before this in um, medical device engineering and also in aerospace engineering. I, I worked a bit for a Formula One team for a while as so, well. So yeah, top draw, kind of, so, so componentry like, is important in that. Yeah, things. and so I think even if you look at this panel, you can almost like see that it's like, it's both at the same time retro, but also modern. Everything's like really sort of solid and kind of engineered. It looks a little bit like an avionics control panel as well <laughs> as looking like a, a sort of an 80s inspired synth, but... Um, and, and interestingly, no LCD. There just doesn't require any LCD anywhere. I mean, no. it's, it's just all front panel. That was really, um, you know, we, took, we thought and agonized about this a lot. And we had a lot of sort of, um, pulling in different direction effectively. It's just like, can you have a synthesizer without an LCD display that still gives you that depth and interest so that you don't get bored? And, you know, so we've, we said, right, okay, that's our limitation. We have a limitation, we're not gonna use a display. And so then we're gonna work really, really, really hard to use our buttons, to use our sort of multifunctionality here, um, such that we really get in the we get in the depth and the interest without having to have anything that stops your flow. I know that right. word gets overused a little bit, but it's it's a good word. Yeah. You know, when you're kind of playing and you're sort of jamming at different sort of bits and pieces on the synth, you don't want anything to like stop well, yeah, you. Yeah, we've got an arpeggiator and a sequencer. Forgot to mention that. Oh yes, yeah, we have indeed. I think, is the sequencer implemented yet, or is it just the arpeggiator? The sequencer's not implemented right. at the moment. Um, we've sort of got a very nice arpeggiator, and we've sort of been getting that bit right, but the sequencer is one of the things we're working on at the moment. And is that going to be note only, or are you going to be able to parameter, uh, record parameters in the sequencer as well? Yeah, um, yeah sorry, I get focus. distracted. Focus, <laughs> focus, yes, absolutely. Um, so the sequencer here has got some interesting modes um, where you can record steps, slides, accents, sort of almost AKA TB303, which is um, rests, of course, and adjust the sequence length. Um, and you also, although along with the notes, it re records polyphonic notes. Right. It also records the position of the bender at each step. Now I know that may seem slightly weird, why the bender of other things, but it lets you do a little bit of pitch expression on your sequence right. as well, that's sort of subtle, based on your dedicated um, bender controls here. Okay. So you've got those. But then, because of course it goes through the um, modulation matrix, which I'm adjusting here, um, you can, of course, map your um, bender oh, to all sorts of as a front. source. Right, okay. To, so, sort of, yeah, okay. Yeah, you can map as, as to, you know, LFO1 or cross mod depth or envelope decay. So, so you can, it's like a trick. This it's a, perfor is it's a, per of, a performance aspect to the sequencer, right? Okay. Absolutely, okay. yeah. And, of course, the bender is quite a nice thing to move so that actually, if you're, if you're tapping in sequences, the bender is quite an easy, okay. comfortable Well, we'll look thing. forward to seeing that. Yeah, um, no, me so too. I'm looking forward when's to playing the, with So, it. I mean, I'm guessing, what, 2020, early th early 2020, what's the what's the plan? Early 2020, we you know, we've started production now of the hardware. Um, we just got to make sure that we've got all features tight and solid right. um, before we get it out. So it's early 2020, um, obviously as soon as we can, believe you me. Yeah, I'm sure you want to get, <laughs> I'm sure you want to get And And um, has the price changed? I mean, what, what sort of, no. what's your target price for this? In um, so yeah, the price is um, 2295, including VAT, UK right. street price. I believe it's like 2495 right. euros, including European sales tax. And um, 
yeah, so that, that, that's where we are with it. Are you selling it directly or is it through dealers? What's the... This goes through um, distribution and dealerships worldwide. Right. So in most countries of the world, you'll be able, to, most countries, you'll be able, you'll be able to buy it from your local dealer. Um, contact us or contact our distribution and we'll be able to furnish that information. Um, but yeah, you'll be able to buy it through the ordinary channels, effectively. George, thank you so much for coming in no, and sharing Nick, us this. I, I wish you every luck. I mean, looking forward to it. Are you going to be at NAM? We are going to be at NAM. Um, yes, yeah, Right, indeed. well, hopefully we'll see even more then. Uh, you can find out more about this at udo-audio.com udo -audio is the right URL? That's correct, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.